Who the best wide receiver you go up against? Take yeah. me out the equation. Yeah. No, get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> 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 I'm like, come on, Biko, go out of here. I, I would talk about some of the most unappreciated. I would say number one, Mike Evans, man. A, a mm. guy who is that big, six seven, to run routes like that, and his catching grade, consistency. He does it quietly every mm. year. But I go back to my tight end days. Gronkowski was tough again because oh, yeah. he's such a big frame. Even when he's running, his elbow hits you by accident. You're flying a yard mm. over, and it's just. Wow. Uh, I've never tackled anybody, been dragged for that long in my life, you know, it's just, it's very different. But those two kind of stick out to me because this is size and scale. Pull up in the drive light, I didn't miss my with Lego, stack my money up like Lego. What up world, it's your boy Brandon Copeland, aka Professor Copeland, I have to the right of me. My dog, my homie, sometimes I don't really like him because he be talking about my career, but, you know, ultimately, <laughs> He's a friend, you know what I'm saying? Ross Mack. Ross, how you feeling, brother? You already know I'm good, man. I'm uh, not going to lie. Living good, looking good, you know? Looking Unlike good. some of us, but we know. We know, we know. We know. We know. We know. Don't talk about me. No, he's not talking about you. We don't talk about, about the guests on this show. This the man of the hour. I'm definitely not talking about <laughs> yeah, him. But, man. Um, you know, so I'm living great, man. No complaints. Family good. You know, pocket straight. Mm, mm. There you go. You got the, the waves of... Hey. Spinning the day. What like, you do? You on like steroids? A, I got like a 180. Ooh. I ain't 360s yet. I got like 180. It's a good start. They, they come back. You <laughs> know what I mean? Start. It's a good start. I got to head get along. We're going to let you introduce yourself because I don't want to, to to butcher certain things. But first and foremost, man, we got Byron Jones on the podcast today on Money Music Culture. So first and foremost, thank you for being here, Absolutely. my brother. Absolutely. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. But I think that one of the things you find as you... Uh, continue to progress and advance in your career. You get out of the um, deer and headlights mode and you start to do certain things off the field. Sometimes you hear certain names over and over and over again and not for what they're doing on the field, right? Um, and you and I have been able to cross paths um, a number of times in different circles and different groups of like-minded individuals trying to elevate. And it's a true honor to have you on because I know and we know how much football takes from us. It's a beautiful blessing and a beautiful opportunity. So I don't want anybody at home like takes from me. What are you talking about? Right? Like, but the time, the effort, the energy it takes to be the 1% on the football field is a lot, mm -hmm. but you find a way to, continue to dive in off the field, chase your passions, learn about the different things that you have and the different business interests that you have. And so without further ado, Byron Jones, I appreciate you for being on here and I would love for you to introduce yourself appreciate to the Money Music that was great. Audience. That was a great introduction, man. Well done. Um, this is going on year eight for me in the NFL. Um, one thing that was very instrumental early on in my career, I saw the documentary on, on ESPN, 30 for 30, 30 for 30 going broke. Mm. And mm. I said to myself, that ain't finna be me. Mm. I'm getting the bag, I'm not gonna fumble it this time. Right. So, wow. um, no yeah, before I got drafted, I, I started reading personal finance books. And let's be honest, no one likes reading books. It's not fun, but I knew that was my personal responsibility to myself, to my family, to my future family, that I needed to learn this you know, skill set so I'm not losing my money and going back to you know, what I was used to. And when you say before you got drafted, are you talking like in college or like literally no, right before literally you got drafted? Like maybe a month or two before I got wow. drafted. I said, no, nah, let me just learn a little bit at least. Um, and from there, I just kind of fa I found a, a passion in investing and, and um, you know, wealth creation and wealth uh, protection. And from there, I went to private equity about probably, what, uh, four years ago, venture capital two years ago. And I'm, I'm kind of building a, a slow uh, real estate portfolio. I buy and hold real estate. I'm developing a couple of homes in Fort Worth, Texas. Mm. And I'm investing a lot of development deals. Actually, uh, Josh Childress, his land spire, I'm investing in one of his deals too. So uh, that was about six months ago. It's going pretty well. So um, I'm just down to learn, man. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm, I'm extremely curious about a lot of things. And I won't stop until I know. Mm. And, and just so we all on the same page, Josh Childress, he, he owns this. He, he owns. This. He built this. Yeah, place. yeah. Like this. This <laughs> is. Up. This is, and, and it's and it's beautiful uh, to see. And so I, I guess my first question for you is, why private equity? It sounded like that was your first start four years ago, right? Yeah. There was other things out there. Yeah. Why PE? 
Well, uh, to be honest, it wasn't necessarily the first thing I did. So I got, you know, one thing, number one, I got a really good financial team, a good financial mm -hmm. advisor. You do the stocks and bonds. I call it the meat and potatoes of my portfolio. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, I met a guy, he was selling shirts in his apartment in New York City. And uh, I saw the passion and, and just the, the drive he had to kind of make this a company. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, I want to see what I, what I can do in this. I want to put some money behind him. Thank God he's still doing well now, uh, you know, five, six years later. Uh, but that was my first taste into private equity. That was probably probably venture at that time, really. Um, but then from there, I, I, I linked up with a really good team called Patrick Off Co. And they do a great job at teaching me the foundational, the, the fundamentals of investing at that level. Mm -hmm. And there's something special about, you know, let's be honest, the, the, investment, the investment memos are long, sometimes 50, 60 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to be good in anything, you got to put it in the work. And the work is, at the very least, reading it, understanding it, asking the questions that you aren't clear about. Um, and I, I think the system that Patrick Off created allow me to, again, find another passion in investing in a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and private equity was that space for me at the time, and it still is. And um, it, it's a blessing because not only can I invest, I'm also on advisory boards, and it's a chance for me to learn uh, from the CEO, CMO of a company, a major company, uh, about how to run a strategy, how to do the marketing, where to put the products and stuff like that. So mm. um, anything that, that fills my cup in terms of learning and, and, and fills my cup in terms of curiosity, uh, I'll find a way to get some money in there, put some skin in the game, and, and learn from there. If you're enjoying this conversation, then why not be a part of it? Leave us a like and a comment on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, and tell your friends they can find Money Music Culture wherever they get their podcasts. So it's a very interesting thing that one of the first things you said is I have a great financial team. Now you have some athletes who have not had nearly as good luck, right? It could be stories of like maybe even Duncan or KG, some of their financial advising teams kind of led them down a bad path. Um, so curious, yeah. what went into you selecting your financial team? Like, what was important to you? How yeah. did that work? It's kind of bizarre. So I, you know, they 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 work with a, a bunch of other athletes, which uh, that was a good thing for me because we have unique challenges that I mm -hmm. want them to know and understand. But mm -hmm. it's funny they even said it themselves through interview process. Sometimes a guy will only interview them one time and they'll sign up. Mm -hmm. Are you mm -hmm. giving all your life's money to this you know advisor you only made him one time for 30 minutes yeah. mm -hmm. uh and they laugh about the process that i put them under because <laughs> i was now interviewing everybody yeah. multiple times i want to see what you said in the first meeting is the same thing what you say in the third meeting mm. yeah. um so i was very uh you know I, i'm not gonna sit here and act like i knew exactly what i was looking for um one thing i liked about my advisory firm uh, that i work with now is that uh they had a lot of good guys on their, their, their team they're not dealing with knuckleheads they're not dealing with just a superstar because of superstars you're dealing with you know, genuinely good people who care about you know, wealth protection, care about the family, stuff like that. That, that means a lot to me. Mm. What type of people are you associating yourself with? So I, that, that was big for me. Uh, and, and secondarily, um, the learning aspect. They did a really good job getting me from point zero to point one where I am today. So um, I think getting the recommendations and, and hearing their clients talk about them and um, seeing that they weren't dealing with knuckleheads and, uh, and knowing that they're gonna teach me along the way were, were three big things for me in that process. Mm. Yeah. So. You gotta take me through this a bit, right? And, and I really want you to describe it for the audience. Sunday, <laughs> you go out, got the fans screaming, all of those types of things, right? It's a different type of pressure. And I think, you know, I don't know about your feeling and thoughts on this, but you know, you feel, you played a few games, so you, you, you get a little acclimated, you get yeah. used to what you're gonna feel and all that stuff. Flipping your first home. Mm. Talk to me about that type of pressure, uncomfortable, butterflies, what, what, what was that process like? I'll be like? very honest, nothing at all yeah. in terms of nervousness and anything like that because I knew I had a really good uh, partner. Mm -hmm. um, he's doing, he's on the operational side. Truthfully, the way it's set up, I'm essentially the bank and he's the operational side, but the awesome part about him, and I give him a lot of credit, his name's Andy Williams, he has taught me from the ground up real estate. He actually wanted to invest, he wanted me to invest in a deal with him maybe three years ago. I said, listen, I know nothing about real estate, but if you're willing to teach me, uh, maybe we can do something in the future. And mm. to his credit, every month or so, he'll call me and give me an update on what he's doing, what he's thinking, what's happening in, in the real estate mm. market. That was one of the rare people that actually followed through on it, you yeah. know? Mm. And again, we talked about finding partners that fill your cup, mm -hmm. they fill your curiosity, and that he was definitely one of that. So one of them. So, um, you know, when it came to the time where I felt comfortable understanding it, he showed me the playbook. We, we've, we've gone through it, you know, 25 other times, and he found me a couple of lots. I said, let's do it, because now I know. I, mm -hmm. I see. It takes the nervousness out of it. Now, there's still risks, there's still uncertainties. Uh, but when you run your numbers, you run your comps, you understand the market, 
Um, it's not a short shot, but you have a really good starting point. Right. And at, at, there was no point where I felt uncomfortable in that deal, to be very honest. Yeah. But you know, selling it in my first single family home to a single mother, that was, that's the reason why I'm doing it. And that reminded me very early, like, this is why, man, you're making new housing stock for people that are just starting their, you know, their careers in, 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 this, in this, you know, to Fort Worth, Texas in that community. Yeah. And, you know, I think we all know the number one way of people build wealth in America is through home ownership. Yeah. So yeah. Um, providing that ability for that single mother to build wealth for her family and yeah. for the future. So uh, that's why I'm doing it. And I'm so excited for the, for the next projects that I have in the pipeline. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure we don't gloss over the fact that, um, you just mentioned he came to you three years ago, three or about years ago. three years ago, yeah. right? And yeah. instead of just diving in head first to say you're in it, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a real estate investor, right? Or I, I invest in crypto. I do this. <laughs> I do that, right? You said, no, 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 no. That's not. change his bio to investor on, <laughs> on Instagram. Oh, just close. Like, right, just right. close. Like, really, bro? <laughs> hey, you know, you, you said, look, I'm a, I'm a, I know my lane. I know me. Yeah. Let me get comfortable with this. And let me put the time, effort, energy into understanding this more. Yeah. And also, let me make sure that you as a partner are a potential good fit yep. via communication and transparency over these next few years so that when I do decide to dive into this, I'm diving in correctly. Amen. You know, I think Rick Ross Amen. has said it, you know, I, I don't care how slow we move. I just care that we move correctly. Mm -hmm. I care that we move right yeah. the first time, you know? And I think that's major because a lot of us feel that urge of like, oh, I feel like I'm gonna miss out. Yeah, Anthony yeah, just not. texted me. I feel like, oh, this is the, this is the house, yeah, the you one. know? It's the one. As opposed to like, mm, it's gonna be another house yeah. and it's gonna be another opportunity mm -hmm. and taking the time to invest in yourself and making sure the people around you and that financial team are investing in you. Amen. That's major, man. Amen. So one thing you said, man, that just resonated with me was like, when it comes to your real estate, you're also providing opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just about the money. You're in a position, obviously you wanna make money. We're all business people. However, you just afforded the luxury and opportunity to a single mom to actually own property. So when you start thinking about, you know, your investments from a standpoint, like how are you balancing kind of a good social deed as well as yeah. a good return? That's a really good point. Um, you know, the cool thing about real estate is I, I do see it as twofold. It's a sustainable business, obviously a lot of wealth creation there. But when you think about you know, back in your childhood, think about, how important and impactful real estate was in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. yeah. where your friend's house was, where the park was, where the grocery store is, where you got your candy from. Like you interact with real estate on a level that you probably has become subconscious. But mm -hmm. when I look back, like, can I design neighborhoods better? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a social impact with designing, you know, well-designed homes and buildings and things that just make sense. And um, you know, I want to be a part of that creation. It's a, it's a field that there's not much rep representation there. So. Um, you know, for me, it's understanding like this is a, a, a create, this is a, a sustainable business. It's not donation in, by any means, mm -hmm. but there's a social impact you're having. You're again, you're allowing people to own a piece of the land, own a piece yeah. of the house in this country, and be able to build their wealth. And it goes beyond just the house. It's also uh, having good homes in good school districts. It's you know mm -hmm. being next to good grocery stores. It's being next to good healthcare centers. It's all that stuff that goes into uh, improving the condition of your life. So, mm -hmm. uh, really, say it's a, a powerful tool. That, that I, I see that I'm probably gonna get deeper into as I transition from football to uh, the real world. Mm. The yeah. real world the real transition. World, you know what's crazy? Like, not only that transition, but it's an overall cultural paradigm shift when it comes to athletes and entertainers now being accepted in the world of business, right? Well, more importantly, it's accepted that, you know what? I'm already preparing for life after sports or, yeah. uh, or just outside of entertainment right we saw it with the nipsey hustles we see yeah. it with every artist now is trying to you've got yo Gotti owning a soccer team go, right like the, the the world of athletes and entertainers now getting into real business mm -hmm. not just like oh i'll endorse your pro your your product it's like no yeah. i need equity and more importantly i'm now putting my capital to work so like tell me why that's so important to you now and where do you see that going, especially as you say, life after football? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you a story. Uh, so it's just 2015, I was going through the draft process. I was kind of a, after the combine, I was a high, a high rated pick. So I was doing a bunch of interviews at uh, facilities and in mm -hmm. front of owners and GMs. And I got you know, like training. And one of the, the coaching points for that training was, hey, Byron, we know you did some internships in college. Don't talk about that. Mm. 
They mm -hmm. want you to be just a foot. They want to know that you just care about football. That's all you care about. That's all you think about. There was this ideology that you can't do anything other than just play mm -hmm. football. And that's what, at the time, owners didn't want to know that you're interested in other things. They just want you, they want you hungry and dying for the game of football. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. But some guys are like that. I never was. But I had to kind of fake it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I get into these spaces, uh, whether it's private equity, real estate, um, you know, it's my opportunity to put my thumb on the scale. It's my opportunity to use my capital as a means of, of you know, creating the change that I want to see. You know, these massive funds, they do it themselves, so why not me? You know, why not, mm, why shouldn't I get a chance to actually, you know, put my money behind companies that I believe in and, and shape the world that I want to see for the future for my kids and their kids. Um, so that's what's so important for me is just, um, you know, making, making sure these kids realize there's other things out in this world other than just being an athlete. I, I want them to see us as an athlete and X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, and, and I think guys that have come before me have done a great job, and I, I can't wait for the younger generation to see what they're going to actually do because, like you said, it's far more accepted now in today's age than it was even when I was coming uh, yeah. through the draft process. I felt that same... Well, I, I didn't have people coaching me up through my interviews because I wasn't getting that many <laughs> interviews. But, but you know, at a certain time period in the NFL, it was like you don't talk about what you're doing off the field. Like you said, they want to know, hey, I'm investing in you, and you better be thinking about football all day. They'd rather you go home and play video games than yeah. working on real estate, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of changed the perspective of certain coaches once the things I was doing off the field got – more more public and say hey well it's the same time but instead of me playing video games i'm yeah drawing up kitchen designs <laughs> and stuff you know mm -hmm. but when did you get comfortable sharing this mm -hmm. right because i understand that you That's are a question. beacon in your locker room and people gravitate towards you and what you're doing mm -hmm. off the field so like what year did you become comfortable saying no i'm interested in this yeah i, I would say probably year four uh year three year four just understanding that um, you see other guys in the locker room doing a little bit here and there, and you know you kind of ask questions about what they're doing. And uh, a couple of the guys had foundations that I was very curious about. Mm -hmm. So um, seeing that early on allowed me to understand, like, okay, like I kind of knew it's acceptable. You know, people are scared to kind of share what they want to do off the field, but you know, seeing it in your locker room to a small extent kind of opens you up a little bit. So mm -hmm. I would say year three and four, and I would say really the past two to three years. You know, I've seen a shift where players are coming up to me and asking me questions, yep. young guys are mm -hmm. you know, wanting to reach out and talk about this stuff. And it's, it's a much bigger conversation in the locker room nowadays than it was when I just got there. So you're seeing the cultural shift happen, um, you know, for me in an eight year span, which is incredible to see. So uh, I hope we never go back to that time period where we can't discuss what we do off the field because that's just yeah. that's mind boggling that that was the case for so long. Yeah. Uh, you can do many different things. You can you're just not one being on this earth. It's a paradigm shift. Like when I worked on Wall Street, bro. For one, the idea of having an outside business or anything, right? Interest is one thing, but outside business, you got to get that approved by compliance. Mm, yeah. I remember going to <laughs> going to going to work one time, my music on the radio, and I'm like, damn, I'm going to work. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I get in there, and then I get a meeting with compliance. They're like, hey, what's what you got going on outside of work? Let's oh. talk about that. I'm like, bro, don't worry, I'm getting out of here soon. <laughs> y'all just relax. But I got a question because the name of the podcast is money, music, culture, right? And um, part of the culture is what y'all do is athletics, right? Like yeah. every kid in inner city, one, think we either gonna go pro or be some type of entertainer. And every kid in the world aspires to y'all. But you're an interesting spot, right? You're a cornerback. So I gotta know, who the f*** is the hardest cover, right? Who the best mm -hmm. wide receiver you go up against? Really that might be different. Yeah. Take the me best? Out. Take yeah. me out the equation. Yeah. No, get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> 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 Come on, Biko. Go out of here. Man. So I don't know if best versus the hardest is two different yeah. things. I don't know. Like mm. it's tough, man, because all the receivers you guys hear about, they are absolutely the real deal. There's no one that's hyped up like these guys are the real deal. Mm. Um, I I would talk about some of the most unappreciated or unrepresentative guys. Mm -hmm. I would say number one, uh, Mike Evans, man, a, a mm. guy who is that big, six seven, to run routes like that, and his catching grade, consistency. He does it quietly every mm. year. 
You know, he's over a thousand he yards. And he had like over a thousand yards for like eight years, something crazy. Like, mm -hmm. and no one, you know. Bro, so humble. They don't even celebrate. He, he ain't dancing in the end zone. He just yeah. out here doing his thing. Awesome people. Shout just out walking to back to the brother Mike. Yeah, 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 shout out to Mike. We man. got the, some land together in Tampa. Uh, shout out to oh, brother yeah, Mike. Uh, you know what I'm saying? My dog, you know, shout you out. Businessman, businessman. Yeah, yeah, we on. like that. We like that. But, uh, you know, it's funny. I go back to my tight end days. Uh, actually, Gardner Ground, Kosh Gronkowski was tough again because oh, he's such a big frame. And even when he's running, his elbow hits you by accident, you're flying a yard mm -hmm. over. And it's just, wow. uh, I've never tackled anybody and dra been dragged for that long in my mm -hmm. life. You know, it's Ooh. just, it's very different. Um, but those two kind of stick out to me because this is size and scale. I mean, see, all the rock mm -hmm. runners, are, they're incredible. But those two guys, man, I'm like, man, that's a real deal. All right, so talk about Gronk. Who harder to tackle, Gronk or Derrick Henry? <laughs> oh, that's tough, man. Oh man, it's a different beast. Yeah, two different type of shifts. Yeah. See, I think, and, and you're, you're asking I mean, it's him. Just, it's well, I asked both. both. I, like, both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I you, don't, you don't give a damn about my my opinion. Like, I don't play football. <laughs> like you don't play ball. Ball. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll go both. No, I mean, I, I I would say it's different because Gronk usually when you have the ball, when usually when Gronk catches the ball, right? Like he's in a I'm running away from you mode, Bulls, right? Yeah. Derrick Henry. Because he's getting the ball behind the line of scrimmage, he's more in a, I know you're the obstacle and I'm running through you mode. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it's like, it's a difference between, okay, I got to grab this dude at his hip, his side, all that stuff. And you might be coming, you're coming from a different position. Yeah, so it's a different angle, right? But um, for me, to be honest with you, because we're in the, the box, it's easier to tackle a Derrick Henry because he hasn't even got up to speed by the time he gets to me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Gronk, it's like, I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm, Gronk, I, he, he 0 for 3 on me, Gronk. Hey, every time they throw to Gronk and I'm covering him, he, he hasn't caught the ball. We Let's can go. run the field. We gotta run the field on that. that. I, I, that's just all I'm gonna say. Whether it's the Jets Challenge flag, I'm throwing out this year. But go ahead. No, I agree. That's, that's a really good point. Is uh, Oftentimes when Gronk's getting the ball, he's in the open field. You know, mm -hmm. He's trying to score. He's trying to stiff on me, maybe jump over you. Uh, you know, what's so impressive about Derrick Henry is his ability to break away, like to be that big and have that level of speed is crazy. Like yeah, it shouldn't yeah. make, it shouldn't be possible. It, should, <laughs> it yeah. shouldn't be possible. Yeah. Um, so to see some of the years that he's had, I love watching guys just excel and, and, and do well like that. So that was dope. What, what do you think, we, we go into sports, right? So, so what do you think is the key to that long-term success in the NFL, right? And it's different for certain players, but like, um, You've seen some of the Alabama guys, Alabama running backs, not last as long, right? They talk about Alabama guys, you, you've gotten so much wear and tear on your body through college, and you get to the league, and it, you don't necessarily last as long. Mm -hmm. Derrick Henry, he's lasting, right? I, I remember I always go to veteran players in the locker room when I was with the Patriots, Matt Slater, Devin McCourty, right? Like, what are you guys doing? What's your routine? Like, how can I learn from you so that I can take a, a little something and incorporate it in my plan? But your perspective, what's – your key to sustain success in professional football? You know, I, I don't want to underplay this, but I think, you know, number one, a lot of it's luck. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you right watch first, first a game or you watch practice, you see 10 different ways someone can have torn their ACL mm -hmm. or torn a hamstring or you know, dislocated their shoulder. Um, so for it's sure. really about the grace of God that we get out healthy for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's been true for my career. But a lot of it's being consistent consistent on uh, what you're eating, how you're sleeping, um, what you're drinking, what you're intaking, um, and also how you how you recover. Mm. You know, what cold tubs, hot tubs, cryo, whatever whatever your routine, whatever works for you, stretching, masseuse, yoga, um, finding a good consistent routine and sticking to that, that's probably your best shot at, at, at having longevity. And I say certain positions can last a little bit longer than others. Quarterbacks can last a little bit longer than, say, a running back because those guys are getting hit all day. Uh, but I think uh, some a, a good component of it is is just luck, man. Yeah. I mean, whether you're getting sure. concussion, you get knocked in the head, and you're out for six games, or it's a knee injury that nags for a year, a year and then they, and finally tear your ACL. So uh, I, I've seen a lot of guys who've done everything right. You know, they 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 try to do everything by the books and still, you know, not have the health that I've been afforded with and a lot of my teammates have been afforded with. So yeah, um, yeah I think the best chance for yourself is consistency. Yeah. My grandfather, he played 11 years in the NFL, and one of the things he used to always say was, uh, he would tell me this in middle school and high school and preach it to me, that the three things he feels like ruin a career or could derail your career, 
and he would say, two of them are within your control, one of them's out of your control. Mm. One, women mm -hmm. in your control, right? How you, you know, allow that to affect your game, your professionalism, all those things, right? Two, drugs and alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. In your control, right? Three, out of your control, injuries, health, mm -hmm. all of those things. But ultimately, all of them kind of boil down to discipline and creating that routine and creating those things and those structures to keep you to stay in your lane. And, and uh, like you said, you know, it's a lot of luck. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of being in the right place, right time, yeah. and staying out of the wrong place yeah. at the wrong time. It's easy for me. I'm a square. I ain't going out. I ain't partying. <laughs> I ain't really picking up mm -hmm. girls like that. I'm just laying low, man. That's mm -hmm. been my motto since I was a kid. Yeah. Focusing so, on that, opportunity. Yeah, just focusing on this opportunity, man. It's short, so. Yeah, no, that's make, real. Make the best out of it. We had the opportunity to uh, interview uh, Juice Landry, and we were talking about the sacrifices. Yeah. And um, he was like, "Dude, I never had a spring break like some of y'all. Mm -hmm. Like my spring break consisted of working out. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, just even hearing that, right? Like, the square persona is actually what focus. you call focus, putting in the work, right? Yeah. Work now, play later. And I think that's a grind. That's admirable." I, I don't call it a square, I call it like, because you're here, right? For one, we all on borrowed time, but after yeah. you motherfuckers on, I don't even know what <laughs> type of time that is. That's repossessed time. Like, y'all <laughs> shit is really like very finite. So that's just to understand that. And I'm going to come clean. Like, us, all of us sitting on our couch, I probably had the best little league football career out of all of us. All right. You know what I right, mean? But y'all just y'all just we grew just a little going. more than me. Going, you know what I mean? Like with my fifth grade, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> fifth and sixth, I went was crazy. Top went crazy. Right. I was top notch. You know what I mean? They have, they have. Um, but no, I think what y'all do is dope, bro. But honestly, I just want to tip the hat because y'all are athletes, but I feel like y'all athletes second, businessmen first, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, not a lot of people, you know are like that and not and y'all both were just on the panel and I'm like yo these guys get it um and I could only imagine like you say people are gravitating to y'all in the locker room right now god forbid right you know football is over tomorrow what's yeah. what does life look like good question so mm -hmm. number one race car driving that's my passion man wow. I love cars I've always loved cars since I was a kid uh, big Porsche fan love my classic Porsches and um, love taking it to the track in Dallas. I'm a member uh, down there in Dallas. What's Dallas, the fastest so. you had it? You had it I, don't even know, I don't really care about the speed. It's the turns, man. It's hitting oh, the turns, right? Getting yeah. those things right and finding the balance and hitting the brake. It's, it's so therapeutic for me. That's uh, so that's my passion, number one. I'll do that on the side, very low-key amateur level. Mm -hmm. I ain't good. Uh, and and secondly, good. I think um, probably going deeper in real estate, again, because you have such an impact in people's community. Uh, I think that's really inspiring and, and that's fun and that's a good challenge for me. Mm. It's something completely different than uh, what I thought I'd be able, to do, be able to do. And I never, never dreamt of, you know, I didn't know that you can be a part of the creation of a build. I just, you just kind of, a, you don't even think about when you're a kid. You don't think yeah. about, you know, what the expenses are, what the NOI is. You're not mm -hmm. thinking about any of these costs or developer fee, like, you know. So to learn about this space, it's like, oh my goodness, it's opening up a whole new world that I didn't know existed. Uh, so I'd love to get into that, but also just being an all-around investor in different things. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty agnostic in terms of the industry. I don't care. It's just as long as I understand it, as long as you're willing to teach me, as long as I can learn, you know, I'm happy to throw some money in and let's see what happens. So mm. um, I want my tentacles in a lot of different areas. I like that concept. Final question. Well, I think I know your answer here, so I'm going to have to switch it up a little bit. Long story short, Ross was speaking to a group of kids one day about long-term investing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, being patient and hey, I'll show you all how to become a millionaire. You need 30 years, you do this, 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 and over time, boom, you got it automatically, right? Compounded interest. Exactly, Most right? Deep. Consistency. But one of the young boys <laughs> said, hey man, that's, that's, that's cool what you're talking about, but I, I'm trying to get it today. I love it. How do I get it today? And so if that person was asking you that question, what is your answer to that kid what's the investment that they need to be making today to uh change yeah, we're their life putting you on the spot. to get it in one i mean hit the lottery go ahead go mm. you know get a lottery ticket see gamble. if you get yeah go gamble if you want to <laughs> well it's not gonna really be the day but like yeah. near term as opposed yeah. to right think about it oh like the best performing asset class you're asking yeah, yeah. oh man jesus you'd be remiss to, to look over uh you got 
talk about crypto, although it's not a good market right now. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's potential for it to explode. I think it's going to be a big factor in our lives in the future, but mm -hmm. uh, definitely on the rocky roads now. But I think that will be a, a, a good asset. But you got to find the good winners. That's that's obviously mm -hmm. uh, much harder than it, it's, it, you could say. So I would I would say crypto, man. It yeah. seems to be that's where a lot of people have gained a lot mm -hmm. of wealth in the past two years and. Hopefully they didn't lose it all. They sold a little bit, got some real cash, and yeah. bought some nice things, and uh, made some smart investments. But um, you know, I can't imagine an asset class outperforming that over the course of a long time. Mm. Just knowing the type of technology behind it. Right, right. That's yeah. a great answer. Hey, listen, say no more, man. Byron, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us yeah, on yeah. Money Music Culture. Yeah, we yeah. appreciate well, yeah, you, yeah, man. Yeah, respect what you guys are yeah. doing, man. This is awesome. I thank love you it. so much, yeah. man. Well, listen, another episode of Money Music Culture in the books, man. Ross, tell them what to do, man. You already know. Listen, make sure you go like, subscribe, and tell your auntie, tell your drunk uncle from the barbecue <laughs> to share with everybody, right? Share with your teacher, your first grade teacher, your, uh, your childhood crush. Make sure you tune in next week. Let's get it.